Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, Attorney Savania DeBarros. This is Savani DeBrowse, protector of athletes, back again with you for another episode of What Are You Sporting About with John Sovic, who is a therapist and coach. Let me just tell you a little bit about him because he is absolutely amazing. He's a clinical consultant for the Life Group LA, adjunct faculty at Phillips Graduate Institute, and a guest lecturer at Alliant University and USC School of Social Work. He's done so much in the community to help people thrive and to start living a better life. He's also been featured in different types of mediums. He's been featured in Electronic Arts, in the Washington Mutual, on OWN, Bravo, Fox, Cheddar. I mean, all kind of stuff. So welcome to the show, John. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And it's so much to hang out with you and everybody who's joining us today. Yes, yes, yes. So tell us something. Tell us more about you and all the work that you got going on. Wow. How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, I got into uh, my work as a therapist about 16 years ago, but I would say my entire lifetime, I was like meant to be a therapist. You know, I've always been that person that people come to and at the end of conversation say like, wow, I never told anybody that before. So this is really my natural place to fit into life. Um, so I really spend a lot of time getting out there. I speak passionately about helping people like create like the most powerful life that they can for themselves. I think so many of us get trapped in, you know, our own fears, our own stories from families, from communities, and those tend to shut us down. And my work is to get in there with people, find their strengths, see what they already have going for themselves, look at the challenges they have and how can we move through that? And then to send them out into the world to do amazing things. I absolutely love that. Um, So we have, there's so many different people who somewhat loses themselves when they go into relationships or they get married and they realize years later, this is not for me. Or they realize that they can't be the best person, the best member to their family because they lost themselves along the way. Have you dealt with some of that in your practice? And if so, how have you been able to help these particular individuals channel their own self-identity and self-worth so that they can thrive, not just as an individual, but also as an addition to a family. Well, you know, it's so interesting because we have all been handed this story, uh, e- story by either media or movies or television um, that our purpose in life is to find a life partner and that that's the end all be all. Um, first of all, I don't tend to buy off on that. Um, yes, I am happily married. I've been in a relationship for over 20 years and I'm ecstatic about it. At the same time, it doesn't define me as a person. And I think that's what happens a lot is when we get in relationships. I don't know if you've had this, had this happen, but like you have a really great friend, you hang out all the time, you do everything together. And then they get in a relationship and you don't see them for like months on end. You don't hear from them. And that to me is that where the problem starts, where we start to define ourselves by the other person. And over time in a relationship, maybe you start building a family, you define yourself by your partner, by your children, you lose yourself in that. And so for me, the conversation is to remind people of who they were, to find out what those original passions were, and then to see how they've changed over the years. Do you want to start something new in your life based on those old passions? Have you learned something in your life during this time of being there for others that you now want to expand upon? I think those are all like really great places to start on to kind of bounce into the next level of someone's life. That is amazing. That's exactly what I teach people on this podcast and through what are you sporting about the book is for you to fix whatever problems you have or to realize what it is that you want to do. You have to go back to the genesis. You have to essentially find out what you were and I categorize it as dreamer what you were dreaming about before um, so that it can remind you and rejuvenate yourself into accomplishing or wanting to do different things in life or finding, you know, so to speak, your purpose and what your purpose is in life. So I absolutely, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. Well, Um, what's fascinating is when we were little kids, 
we had the ability to fantasize about all kinds of things that we could do with our life. So I'm yeah. going to tell you a story. Please don't <laughs> laugh at me for this one or laugh with me on it. So when <laughs> I was a little kid, every, every, you know, Friday, the garbage truck would come around the corner and they would put the cans on the back and then it would like lift up into the thing. And then the guys would step on the back of the truck and it would drive away. And I told my parents, I wanted to be a garbage man when I grew up. And they were like, well, I think you should shoot a little bit higher than that. I said, but it's so cool because like that truck goes all over the world. And wouldn't it be fun to be riding on the back of the truck that went all over the world? Because my little brain thought like this garbage truck was like flying to Italy and then going to Japan and ending up in South America. And so that's where my passion, my excitement about garbage man had come from. That's and so it's just so cool when we can tap into that um, to find that energy. Because what if for me that was like, you know, part of my speaking stuff has taken me around the world. So that same initiative, that same spark is playing out just in different ways. And it's beautiful because as a child, you're not afraid to dream. You're not afraid to conjure up any possibility in life, right? Mm -hmm. And even the little boy that you were, you didn't even recognize the fact that dump trucks can only go so far within, you know, within the locale of what it is. But in your mind, it was, hey, I can go off into this adventure. I can see everything. I can experience the world and different people. And a lot of individuals can't do that. They are held back based on fear or some other type of restraint that may have been, you know, formulated within the relationship that they may have, or maybe it come from an environmental issue that they have. So what, how can people, how can people um, shake loose of the fears and take action in spite of that, in spite of the anxiety that, that they may feel? Well, for me personally, and the way I work with clients is we have to recognize and label those fears as they show up. So many of them are so deeply ingrained in what we assume to be our personality, our way of life, our way of being. But oftentimes those fears were handed to us by our parents, by our community, by our spiritual experiences, by how we walked through school and what it felt like for us. So show, so many of those fears are based on old stories. And the first step is to actually recognize those fears and see them for what they are. Then we start to look at, well, how are they interfering with my life? What are they doing to get in the way? You know, because I I have a fear, like when I was younger, maybe of like loud voices in the background. Does that like make me start to shy away when I get a room full of people who I'm trying to network with? So looking at that fear, recognizing in the moment, and then learning how to speak to it, how to actually talk back to it. Because if the fear is going to sit there and talk inside our brains, and we all know that we have so many negative thoughts that can run through our brains in a single day. But if we can start to talk right back to it, let's say you are in a networking moment and you're feeling all this fear about speaking up and telling about who you are, maybe you talk to the fear and say, look, I want people to see me. I want people to know me. The message that I want to bring, the work I want to do is bigger and more important than you fear. So let's do this. Let's go talk to somebody. This statement, fears are based on old stories. Fears are based on old stories. And what I connected with this was just the, the previous statement about you as a little boy dreaming about the world, right? But some people can't dream even in, in, in the simplest way of just wanting to see the world because there's been a story that's already been defined to, to them that anything outside of this bubble is dangerous, mm -hmm. or you can't go down the street and do X, Y, and Z because it's dangerous, right? Right. The, the biggest example that comes to my mind is when you talk to older people who grew up in the civil rights movement, the era of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and now you have offspring from both sides. People are afraid to make different moves in their life because it's based off of the older stories that people have passed down from generation to generation. And so, yes, you can try and face those fears head on, but would you agree that part of facing your fear would, would come with a level of educating yourself to break those chains? Mm -hmm. And I want to be really respectful in this part of the, uh, part of the conversation because 
if you look at me, I'm probably one of the whitest skin tone people you'll ever meet in your life. Um, but I've also been blessed by amazing mentors over my lifetime of different ages, different races, different socioeconomic status that have helped me to at least open my heart and my mind to the learning process. So being respectful in this conversation, there are a lot of reasons why some of those fears are so deeply implanted. And we're talking about institutionalized conversations that have told people that they are less than. And often that history is, is handed down as a warning. And it's so challenging and difficult to be maybe the one kid in a family, the one kid in a community who sees something more. And you have to look so deep inside yourself to be able to say, I want and deserve more, and I'm going to make it happen. Because you may not hear it around you. You may hear those fear-based stories, which are based in history, which are based in this deep, deep, deep fear that's been created. And we have to look deeper inside. And if you are that one kid, you need to find where that other kid is who can say, I hear what you're saying, let's try it. And then find that other kid and, and let them connect with you. So that bit by bit, we make community change. We look at this grassroots level of connection to make bigger change around us. God, I love that. I so love that. And, you know, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but that was the one thing that really came to my mind, especially in the wake of all this social unrest. But, you know, really trying to break, break loose of the chains of things that, you you are afraid of things or have anxiety of things, not because you have attempted them and have failed at them, but because it's been ingrained in you for some reason or another. Right. Mm -hmm. um, like a child is not afraid to do anything. For example, I have a three year old. But before he was three, this kid was freaking jumping up all over the couch and I mean, during somersaults, all kind of things. And I was nervous about it. But what I wanted to make sure I did not do was to instill fear and anxiety in him by jumping at every single little thing that he did, you know, because there is there is a lesson in trying something, getting hurt and realizing how you felt in that moment. You know, is that something that would deter you from doing it again? Or is that something to encourage you to say, no matter how hard, you know, how bad it feels, it may still be a, a good thing for you to do to keep moving forward in spite of the fear. Well, and the third thing too is like, so what if your kid has all this energy and they love like flipping off the sofa? What if they're giving you a cue like, I want to do something athletic or I want to learn gymnastics? So instead of the no, 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 what about like, hey, this might not be the best place to do the flips, but do you want to try going into like a, a kid's gymnastics class and see what it feels like? Once again, we listen at such a young age to the energy of no because it becomes very omnipresent in parenting. It does. And parents are well-meaning. They want to keep their kids safe. But those no's tend to build an internal dialogue of no. And suddenly we're walking out into life as an adult and we're saying no to everything. And I think it's so empowering for us to really examine the no's and sometimes step through that fear, like we were talking about earlier, and risk saying yes. I love that. So, okay. So if if people are saying no more often, do you think that is a sign of them willing to play it small? A sign of them being too afraid to really figure out what their dreams are and just go for it? You know, I have two feelings about these words, no and yes. First of all, there's a set of people who overcommit and people please and do everything and have not learned to use the word no. So with those people, it's like, maybe you need to say no occasionally so you have more time for yourself to do the things that you believe in and are passionate in. And then there are the people who have so much trouble saying yes. And with them, I encourage a system of like, just when you're about to say a no, pause for a moment. Look at what what's the worst possible thing that could happen. You and I are on Facebook Live today. It's a live medium. What's the worst possible thing that could happen? I could flub up. We've both kind of misspoken a moment. We've caught our words. Maybe the feed will go out, you know? Maybe someone will like put a comment in that we're both like, oh, I don't know what to say about that. But the possibility of us saying yes allows this communication to happen, allows you and I to both share like our life experiences, what we've learned and what we're trying to bring to the world. So it's that balance of understanding, are you a person who always says no? 
Are you a person who always says yes? And how do you learn to balance those energies out? So what have you, what have you, um, how have you gotten to that, that answer, I guess, as it relates to some of the people that you've serviced to really pull forward why they are saying no more often or why they are saying yes too much? Are they, Mm -hmm. you mentioned like people pleasing. Um, What is, I don't know, like, what is the issue around that? Is it, is it a self-worth problem that they feel like they need to say yes to please people so so people will gather around them to lift them up you know what have you seen i think there are lots and lots of layers to that people pleasing energy sometimes it's just the desire to fit in sometimes it's a desire to be invisible sometimes it's a, it's a desire to be safe um if we have kids who are growing up in unsafe family situations Sometimes people pleasing is a way to stay out of the line of fire of a parent who might be angry or a parent who might be having substance use challenges. It's a way we stay out of, out of, out of the firing line. If we're in school and we're a kid who might just feel a little bit different than what everybody has normed themselves out to be, we take on this invisibility factor. We disappear sometimes. So this people pleasing can take on all kinds of different aspects. What's really important is to detect when we're doing it, and then to reflect on why we're doing it, and then to learn how to change the behavior. For most people that I work with, the simplest place to start is to simply say, pause before you give that automatic answer. Take a moment. Someone asked you to do something. Take an inhale, let the exhale come out, and then say yes or no. Because if we can step out of that automatic behavior, that's where we can start seeing change happen. That makes sense. So at the root of it, you have you first have to understand that you're doing something, that there there is an actual automatic response that you give all the time, but you have to recognize it yourself. So call it what it is. And then take that, take that moment to reflect before you respond. I, I really, really like that. Have any individuals that you've been able to either speak to through your speaking um, journeys or just as a therapist or even as a coach and a professor, because you're so many things, right? I love it. Um, have they been able to then, once they get a grasp a hold of, of those issues, have you seen the creativity grow and sprout and build confidence from that? I have. And, you know, when we're trying to make things happen in our lives, whether it's wanting to be a lawyer or a therapist or a doctor or, you know, a a trash collector, um, when we can start to create a fertile ground, a garden where we say yes to things, where we give ourselves permission to try and fail, that's where change can happen. You know, I work with a, I've worked with quite a few musicians along the way. I've, I've worked with a lot of people in the creative arts along the way. And the thing that we find is the barrier is usually based on some social construct, some bigger story that says, you know, oh, you're too old to dance now. Oh, your type of music is not, you know, acceptable in the industry right now. And when we can like create this fertile ground of yes, all of a sudden we've got creative people like doing their music on YouTube for, for an audience that just begins to develop. We see a dancer going out for auditions and roles that they never thought they would at an older age for a dancer. We see a lawyer stepping up and saying, I want to be part of like community justice and getting out in the world. So if we can lay that fertile ground, if we can lay a space where possibility can be nurtured and could be grown, it's really amazing what can happen. Absolutely. You know, I was part of this panel yesterday and one of the speakers said, it's okay to start again. You know, sometimes I think individuals, whether, and we've had this conversation so many times in the sports, in the sports context, but individuals period feel that if they've reached a certain point in life that they can't start over. You know, um, and then I feel like there's where there's some of these issues come into play about being a people pleaser, being invisible, trying to find places to fit in because you don't feel like you have the ability to start over. But that's a myth. The truth of the matter is you do. And like you said, you have to. The the proof is in the pudding. You have to try. 
but you may fail. You know, the light bulb wasn't built in one day. The south <laughs> light wasn't built in one day. You know, Oprah wasn't who she is in one day. She talks all the time about how much she failed and all the things that happened to her. You know, and I think it's, it's so important for people to understand that life itself is a process, but you can try and fail, but you can try again. Well, and you know, it's fascinating too, because what I notice is that maybe in our parents' generation and in their parents' generation, there was the story that you get a job in your 20s, you stay with it for 50 years, you get a gold watch and, and some retirement pay when you're done, and that's a happy life. And what our generations are looking at is this idea that, no, I may be seven or eight different things during my lifetime. We take the time, we ask ourselves the questions, are we happy? You know, I was working in corporate America before I stepped into, you know, this work as a coach and a therapist. And I did have a moment where I was looking at it as like, I don't think I want to spend a lifetime working this hard for something I don't 100% believe in. And so I took the time to like sit with myself, kind of look at where do I want to go next? The idea of leaving behind a good salary. We've all heard about the golden handcuff to, you know, talk to people. And, you know, one of my amazing mentors said this is like, you can choose to go to grad school and do this. And then if it's not right, guess what? You can choose again. And my mind went like, wait a minute, I can keep choosing. And she was like, yes. And I think that's such the key that ask yourself, check in. Does my day bring me joy? Does my work bring me happiness? Does the balance of my life feel like it's where I want it to be? And if not, there's only one person who can make that change. And that's us. Absolutely. You bring me to another question. The title of this show, what are you sporting about? So a lot of people read this title and think that sporting is just about sports. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Everyone is sporting about something in life. And I call life a sport. It is a marathon, you know, <laughs> that you really have to condition yourself for, right? It's not a sprint. Things just don't happen in one day unless you just come from this magical family, you know, but it is a sport. So with that being said, what does, what are you sporting about mean to you? Okay. So <laughs> when you asked me that once before, I jokingly gave you the word travel. And at the same time, I'm going to stick with that. And here's the reason why. For me, the idea of travel isn't just about going on vacation. It's about visiting places that are outside of my teeny tiny wheelhouse. You know, most of us walk through life with a very narrow bandwidth of experience. And we believe that where we live and where we grow up is the way it is supposed to be done. And then you travel somewhere else. And I, you know, had the opportunity to live in Japan for six months and to understand and, and, and experience an entirely cultural different approach to living from food to work ethic to how, you know, you do recreation. You know, it's amazing to me when I travel. I love looking around because the colors that are used in different color in countries, like even the way they paint their houses gives you a whole different inspirational feel of who you are. It's so bright, vibrant. Yeah. So for me, the idea of travel is this place where we open ourselves up to experience more and to become more. So I am sporting about travel and I'm holding on to that. <laughs> I love that. I mean, that perspective is everything. It's a new perspective on education because I push education so much. I come from a home where it was... It was the thing. It's like, OK, you're going to do education, going to do great at it or you're not doing anything else. All the other stuff you want to do. Right. This is what you have to do. But it is so important. And I talk about that in my book, um, not necessarily in the education part, but I talk about traveling, um, getting experiences, meeting different people, educating yourself more about things that are outside your norm or outside what you think, you know, Um there was someone, I can't remember where I saw this before, and it probably was some years ago, but someone was talking about how as a kid, they would they would go to the library when we all had the encyclopedia books, you know, the travel books, and they would take a vacation in those books. So they would learn so many different things that they weren't, that they couldn't go down the street and receive. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important because if you want to get out of whatever rut you feel like you may be in or some type of stagnant position, it starts with your mind, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It starts with breaking away from what you call the old stories so that now you can create the life that you want for yourself, not what other people said your life is supposed to be. Well, you know, there's there's a beautiful quote that I like keep in my heart and my brain a lot of the time. Um, Albert Einstein, Please forgive me, Albert. I'm going to not ever get this 100% right, but it's something along the lines of you can live every day as if nothing is a miracle, or you can live every day as if everything is a miracle. And for me, leaning into the idea that every moment, every interaction, every experience we have is actually miraculous. Um, to, to understand that, like when I walk the dog in the morning, to be aware and open enough to notice, wow, the neighbor's roses are blooming. Wow, that dog who used to bark isn't there this morning. I wonder where he's at. When you're at the grocery store and they ask you how you are, why not be authentic and be present and, and converse with them and connect? What if every moment actually was a miracle and we began to recognize that, how, how our lives could be so different and so joyous and so full of experience? Wow. Like I'm just, mind is blown, you know, because it it's it's a spiritual connection. Like someone said before, you know, if we can if we can start our day every day with gratitude, just being thankful that we're here, we will have a better day. We will have a better weekend, better month. But the way that you've put this is just, oh my gosh, it it is a whole new awakening because. If you really think about it, every day is a miracle. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take it more to a spiritual conversation, we don't technically know how we wake up every day. Right. I mean, there are some scientists who may explain it and say something about the blood vessels, and (laughs) your muscles and all this stuff. But really, from a spiritual level, like we don't know how we wake up every day. Um, We take a lot of these things for granted. But how you explain it, it, it makes you present for every moment of time, of the day, of your life. And that should in itself provide gratitude that you are here to do the things that you're doing, that you can hear or notice the neighbor's dog barking or not barking, right? So, oh my gosh, I love that. You, you well, just- I don't know if you like experienced injury anytime in mm-hmm. your like sporting life and, and that, but there's this thing yeah. that happens when we're injured where we realize what we're lo- losing or lost or missing in that moment. You know, I remember quite a few years ago, I had some major surgery done on my foot and it made me so aware of that moment of like walking the dog is a miracle. Walking the dog is something. My two feet, my legs, my body, my heart, my breath are all working. This is pretty amazing because when you don't have it, um, it's really scary um, there was such a great moment. So in the neighborhood I lived in, when I got my surgery, everybody knew I was going in for surgery, came out, had my cast on and the doctor said, wait three days and then maybe start getting some light exercise. Well, being me, me being me, I said, okay, great. It feels okay. We're going to go out and get some light exercise. So I got the crutches out and got outside and took a little walk, like to the end of the end of the sidewalk and took a little walk in the block. And then the neighbors were all like, Hey, how's it going? How you doing? It's like, I think I got this. And they're like, do you need help getting back? And it's like, Yes. Um, but it was this thing, this amazing understanding of the miracle of fact that my body could still work. And those moments are really jarring for us. But do we have to go to that extreme to have injury in our life to start bringing gratitude, awareness of the miracle of each day? Or do we have to wait for something dramatic to happen? I have a big believer in the idea that the universe is really, really generous with us. And if we're doing something that's not in alignment, it'll give us a little tap on the shoulder. Then it'll give us a little tap and then it'll give us a little shove. And then if we don't listen, it'll hit us with a two by four. And then we'll be like on our back trying to breathe. So learn to pay attention to those smaller taps. So then you don't have to go through these bigger moments of injury and darkness. And instead you can see the gratitude. You can see the miracle of every day. And it's pretty amazing. That's true. And I, I, I think about it with me. Sometimes I feel like I push myself, like my brain and my body too much without rest. And then there's the day where I can't even get up. I explained it to someone else about like feeling drunk, but didn't have a sip of alcohol, right? Your body is just out of whack and it's telling you 
I can't, I can't do this today. I can't go anymore. So you definitely recognize how you feel and the difference when you are able to come up out of that slumber, or if you're just sick or you have the cold and you remember, because I always do this if I get sick, like I always like, I can't wait to get better. (laughs) And I remember how I felt before this happened. I'm like, oh my God, I cannot wait to get better. But it does, it provides gratitude because you want to be in a space where you can be at your optimal level, your optimal mm-hmm. health, whether it's mental or physical, emotional as well. Um, and I'm going to add this to wisdom you carry now. If you look back to those moments where you overworked your body and you woke up immobilized the next morning, there are actually cues the day before, two days before, a week before that were letting your body and your heart and your mind know, hey, we need to ease up a little bit. But because of that thing that we don't listen sometimes, that's why you end up immobilized in bed. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I think some people and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think some people do this in their their life or the relationships that they have or the professional relationships is they don't know when to stop. They don't know when to say enough is enough. I can't do any much more than what I'm doing now. And that's it. And it becomes too overwhelming and it, it crashes everything else that's happening in their life. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. The hard part of it is when we talk about, you know, our goals and our dreams in relationship with other people is we have to be the carriers of our own torch because I may have an amazing idea and I take it to someone and they're like, yeah, no, that's a stupid idea. And I'm like, no, I really think it's a good idea. They're like, it's stupid. Those voices can shut us down so quickly. So what you need to do is find those people in your life who are affirming and encouraging to say like, I don't know if I understand the idea, but I support you going for it. And then later on, oh, I I see what you're saying now. And then when you're up there, they're like, yay, they're cheering for you because those people are are rare to find. And the more than that we can draw into our world, the the better we're going to be. Exactly. Like creating your own village, putting the positiveness around you. Um, I don't know if you know Tadeo Arnold. He's also a fellow LA person. And one of the things that he said on when I interviewed him was he blocks out people who have anything negative to say, whether it is a dream that he is speaking that he wants to fulfill in the future, or if it's something that's just going on in his life, he has to protect himself to make sure that the negativity doesn't seep in because like you were saying before, people get on this, this, um, this train where these, these anxieties and fears just play over and over again of why they can't do something. And most of the time you can't do something because someone else have told you that you can't do it. Not that you can't do it (laughs) because you believe what other people have said. And so it's so important to make sure that you guard and protect yourself that way. Also your, your mental health, you know, into um, ensuring that you are putting the right people around you who will lift you up, who will champion you, even if they don't have the same dreams or even if they didn't believe that you could do it. Right. Right. But who will still, you know, support you. Well, I have to admit, I did watch the Tadeo interview. It was amazing. Those of you go to the website, you have to watch this. It's pretty brilliant. Okay. Um, For me, my version of it is in our lives, there are people that are going to be light bringers. There are going to be people who are the shadow people. How do you know when you're with them? Okay. So if you're with a shadow person, here's what's going to happen. So you meet them for lunch. You're going to talk. You're going to kind of feel like you're checking out. You're going to realize they aren't asking a lot of questions about you. You're going to leave and you're going to be really tired. Okay. Okay. All of these are cues to you that you are with a person who is actually draining your energy away from you. But now let's say you have a lunch with one of those light bringers. They're going to be curious. They're going to ask questions about you. You're going to feel really focused. You're going to feel lifted. You know, like our conversation today, it's like you are a light bringer and I feel like I'm meeting, you know, a spirit across the, across the airwaves and we're lifting each other. And I'm going to leave that conversation. I'm going to feel excited and I'm going to see possibility. Those are the people that we want to have around us, especially when we're taking on new projects and ideas. Seek out the light bringers in your world. There may be one, there may be a dozen. Find them, let them be the source to go along, to be your team, to be your village and cheer for you as you're walking through this and lift you up when it all gets really heavy. 
real talk, real, real, real talk. Um, and I didn't know how to put a, a title on that because I would talk to my husband sometimes, like if I go certain places or I'm in a room doing something or I'm, you know, just somewhere and there's someone that has this negative energy. It's, it's like I have to focus my energy 200 percent harder to not allow that negativity to seep in because you you do feel your energy just literally drain out. <laughs> um, it's like a heaviness in the air. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I think I heard another description. Um, they're energy vampires. So I mean, that's a really visceral way to look at it, that they meet you and they stand there and they basically just suck the life energy out of you. And then you wonder why you're exhausted or feeling down or feeling gray after the thing. Well, you are, you are missing a pint of blood, a pint of emotion, a pint oh of passion. God. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That I, I can agree. Yes. And I, just saw your eyes, I just saw your eyes list through the energy. <laughs> and you're like, I just saw it happen. You're like, Oh yeah, that person's an energy. Vampire. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my God, John, this has been just, such an amazing talk and I could really talk to you all day. I would prefer to do it in person, <laughs> but of course we are states away and dealing with a national, a global pandemic actually. Uh -huh. But um, I do want to ask you one last question. If there is any key advice that you want to leave our listeners with or people who may be viewing this now or later, what would that advice be? Today, my inspiration would be is your body has all of the information you need to live the best life possible. As we've been talking about the energy of vampires. Notice when your body feels drained. That's a vampire. It's a person who's stealing your energy. It could be that you're not on the right path. Notice when you eat something that suddenly you feel energized and good. Hey, that's the food I want to eat. Your body has so much information, and if we can really pay attention to it, and not as a deficit-based experience. So many of us are trained to, like, say our bodies are bad, or we've got weight, or we've got this or that. But if you use your body as a tuning fork, you will be amazed at how quickly you can find your way along the path of life. Deep. We're going to have to bring you on for a conversation starter. That's all I know, because we need to go longer than this. This, this stuff is... It's mind blowing because it's true. And to have the words, the language placed on top of what people may already know about themselves, but have not had the right language and spiritual language for themselves to be able to move forward and move through um, different relationships and issues. I mean, this is this is just absolutely amazing. Well, John, um, people see your. John Sovic Therapy at John Sovic Therapy. Um, but go ahead and tell other people how they can either work with you, any other platforms that you may be on so that they can follow you as well. Oh, cool. yeah. So you can find me at my website, which is johnsovec.com. That's J O H N S O V E C. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at John Sovac, on Facebook at John Sovac Therapy, and at Instagram at John Sovac Therapy as well. And talking about stepping through fear, INSA is a whole new world for me. I just started in January and I'm doing my best and stumbling through it like a pro. I have to provide this plug to you because someone in the comments said that John is the best therapist in town. So people are already out there raving for you. And that is amazing. It's a testament to the work that you've already done. And this is our first time talking and technically meeting and I can just feel, I can feel the work. I can feel the, you know, the credibleness that's coming from you. And um, I just wish you nothing but the best and continued success for you and for your clients and people who you may be serving in the future. Um, it was my pleasure to interview you. I'm so glad that you were able to take the time and come on stage. For anyone who is interested in working with John, make sure that you go to his website. We provided the information there. You can also go and follow him on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter so that you can stay connected and see the information that he shares to help you live your best life. Again, my name is Savannah DeBurrows, Protector of Athletes. 
Until next time, we'll check you later. Ciao. Thanks for joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About? podcast. Make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at S ldebarros.com. And remember, we're here to educate, support, and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something. 